само мемориал это возникло движение The memorial is a movement which appeared among those repressed and those who knew about it and those who sympathize. Their goal was to preserve and to transmit to future generations the memory of those events, of those people. Memorial Society was created in the Gorbachev years. Andrei Sakharov, while he was still alive, was its first honorary chairman. So it was meant to be both a research institution and to create branches throughout the country where survivors of the Gulag could meet, could collect their testimonies, and they had in mind to create monuments. In October, citizens annually recall the victims at the Sovoletsky Stone in front of the Lubyanka prison, with Memorial in the front ranks. Memorial was to become the champion of human rights in the new order. Its first objective was to connect the old with the new, thus preserving the memory of those who had so long endured the terror in a moving triumph of the human spirit. I feel responsibility for the connection. Much was suffered. I can imagine how those people walked and how they were mocked. And now I don't want that connection to be broken. People must know. People must bring closure to all that happened here. As part of the new educational mandate of the Liberals, the Perm 36 labor camp stands as one of the few surviving mementos of the Gulag era. Viktor Shmirov recounts the abuses of human rights via the history of Perm. In the history of the camp, there were three periods. The Gulag period, the period of the zone for convicted workers of the security organs, and its time as a political camp. Perm 36 was a political camp. As for the generation that's growing up now, it's not that they don't have information about this history. The books aren't forbidden. Be my guest, read the books, they're in the library. But this reading is in no way encouraged. In the history textbooks, the word gulag, in the most recent textbook, was mentioned twice. Therefore, children simply don't have the knowledge. But when they end up here, when they spend time here, the high school students always experience exactly that feeling. They feel ashamed and it causes them pain that this happened. In Germany also, a new generation came of age and admitted the criminality of Nazism. The Gulag itself, um, even though there are heroic groups like Memorial and others that are doing their best to keep alive memories of what happened then, there are also many, including some in Putin's entourage and in the government that succeeded Putin, who want to do their best to whitewash that or airbrush it from Soviet history. With the new liberalism of Glasnost came a moral cleansing, which inevitably sparked unsettling questions about the past. Then unrest, and ultimately fear. All liberal causes swiftly were discredited. The reformers and dissidents had drifted too far out in front of the great mass of the Russian body politic, which has always moved very slowly. They weren't comfortable with that kind of thing. Too much uncertainty, too much chaos, too much unruliness, too much disorder. And then again, well, okay, we've got to tighten up the ship. We can't have people on the extremes. We've got to conform and, and behave. And if anybody who's making too much noise, who's making uh, too many waves, we have to put them in their place. Under Gorbachev, the latter half of Gorbachev, the society began to unravel. Under Yeltsin, it unraveled. Kind of opened the door for somebody to come along and say, we're going to restore order. And that's where Putin, of course, excels. In retrospect, now Prime Minister Vladimir Putin the rugged, iron-willed, ex-KGB man seems to have been born for a major role in Russian politics. Even if, briefly, the American president warmly proclaimed him to be a man the West can do business with. That was never where Putin's heart was. Putin wants very much to restore Russia's role as a superpower. I've heard him speak about this several times. and There is a sense that Nobody paid attention to us before. And we were a superpower. It was our great disgrace, our humiliation, that we lost that status when the Soviet Union fell apart. 
And we want to build that up again. In building it up again, one has to gloss over the past. After Vladimir Putin came to power, there has been a steady, not full-scale rehabilitation of Stalin, but certainly a revival of many official favorable references to Stalin. In addition, the Communist Party in Russia has always admired Stalin and has never made any uh, pretense otherwise. It has um, remained unabashedly admiring of Stalin. Russia has changed. It is a different country. It is richer for its oil supply and steeped in consumer options to please a stronger middle class. More financially stable and more secure than she's ever been in her entire history. Much freer and more open too, though hardly the democracy some had hoped for. The strong-armed tactics of the old days appeared neither desirable nor necessary. Yet the Russian military show of force in South Ossetia in the summer of 2008 challenges that notion. The governor of St. Petersburg gave this incredible speech in which he said, people laughed at us, and disregarded what we had to say, paid no attention to us. Now we're strong again, and they have to listen to what we say, and they have to pay attention. It seems to me that it's very, very important for the Russians to understand their past and to discuss it and to keep the discussion of it going, because if they don't, there is a danger that the past could, if not repeat itself exactly, because that's not what's going to happen, there are certainly elements of the police state that, that could come back again and are beginning to come back again now. So, in effect, it became a battle of memories. The nostalgia for lost power and glory held by some against the loathing for that same regime's gruesome excesses held by others. In the end, nostalgia appears to have won. If you agitate too much or too loudly about human rights abuses, you can find yourself in deep trouble. Today one must speak of almost open opposition and open enmity. That mild malevolence of the recent past has become open hostility, enmity on the part of the government toward Memorial. This government enmity was displayed to chilling effect on December 4th, 2008, when elements of the security forces stormed the Memorial offices in St. Petersburg. In a raid lasting seven hours, these masked officers cut the phone lines and seized computers and archival materials. Russia today is at the crossroads, A Memorial has helped significantly in pointing out directions. As for the guilty, however, those who were the merchants of the terror, the heartless abusers of human rights are still around in significant numbers, yet they walk freely. As for punishment, there is no one to punish. The entire government is made up of those very people. They aren't going to punish themselves. There is no one to punish. I don't think that Putin's government, I don't know about Medvedev, but Putin's government doesn't think there is a problem with human rights because he truly believes, like a lot of despots, in fact, that whatever they do, they do for the good of the nation, and they are the only ones who know what the good of the nation is. Russia will bear on. She always has. But some wonder how this nation can manage all the inherent contradictions she tolerates with that lingering stoicism shaped by her painful history. Might, in the end, the illusion fail to suppress the reality? I can't understand how you can live next door to somebody who may have denounced you and then come back and then just go about life without some kind of resentment, without some kind of punishment, without some kind of retribution. Almost every family had some relative or some acquaintance who had been imprisoned or sent to a gulag or, or executed. So it wasn't exactly that it was a big secret that nobody knew about it. And how people could live with this kind of thing is something that I just cannot understand. And yet they can and do. Russians evoke and discard 
what has been often called the unmanageable past for the sake of the future. Yet they can be comfortable with their somber history. Vigilance and a moral conscience provided by human rights groups like Memorial may eventually thaw out the iced over memories. In 2003, at the 50th anniversary of Stalin's death, Anne Applebaum wrote about the need to uncover the truth about the Gulag. We need to know why, and each story, each memoir, each document is a piece of the puzzle. Without them, we will wake up one day and realize that we do not know who we are. Thank you.